Okay, microphone on. Okay, great. Um, well, thank you all very much for coming. I'll try to include everyone here. It's a wide room. Um, okay, so yeah, Postgres, well, not your job. Now, I think it, back in the day, there were DBAs, and there was the DBA glass house, and you went to the DBA, you asked for schema changes, and that's all gone now because we're in the DevOps world, which um, DevOps means like an integration between development and operations or cross-functional skill sharing, or sometimes it means maximum automation of development and deployment processes, and what it really means is we're too cheap to hire operation staff. Anyway, cloud, so problem solved. <laughs> Thus, companies don't have an experienced DBA on staff. They probably wouldn't know one if it bit them. Um, and you know, have you seen how much those people cost? And, you know, um, develop, so, which means development staff are pressed into duty as database administrators. Um, but that's okay. It's PostgreSQL. Everybody loves PostgreSQL. Uh, for the one person in the room, maybe who doesn't, who's at a Postgres talk, not knowing what it is, um, it's a robust, feature-rich, fully ASA-compliant database. It's kind of the reference database for Django, I would say. It's ba the back Django back Postgres backend is a little more fully fledged than the others can handle terabytes or more. The biggest da PostgreSQL database I've ever heard of that's running on a standard, unmodified, non-commercial port of Postgres is 10 petabytes with no sharding. Sharding's cheating. So it will handle your database. Anyone who says Postgres does not scale, just sort of cock your head as if they were speaking, you know, Lithuanian. Um, and it's very well supported by pretty much everything. So, and it's open source under a very permissive license. So. Um, you will not wake up in the morning and find, a, find out that a large database company has just bought your open source database out from under you. <laughs> Naming no names. But then you say, well, Postgres, problem solved. You know, you walk up, pat the elephant, and everything's fine. And they say, well, no, but no, it's hard to configure. Have you opened PostgreSQL.conf? Oh my god. Um, it requires a lot of ongoing maintenance. They'll just say vacuum and run away screaming with this kind of paralyzed look. Um, it requires really powerful hardware, you know, like things with really big blinky lights, not just the little ones that can super great, but big blinky lights. Um, and it's, it's SQL, it's boring, and it's also not web scale. Or elephant scare me, I don't know, you know. There, someone will come up with a reason if they don't like Postgres. You know, and the reaction is sort of like, oh my God, it's like this, and we're all going to die, you know? It's like, it's a Russian nuclear reactor control room which can usually do less damage than Postgres if you do it wrong, but anyway. Um, but really, it's like this. Big red button, you know, database on. You walk away, it hums. It's very nice. Um, so this is like a little server that's sitting in my office, my brilliantly kitted out office there. I bought it in 1997 from the Dell website, I think. Um, it's running 9.2, the most recent version of Postgres. So whatever your argument is about what Postgres can't do, your argument is invalid. So, let's talk about PostgreSQL when it's not your job. We're gonna talk about basic configuration, easy performance boosts and avoiding horrible things, um, how to do ongoing maintenance, and we're not gonna talk about hardware selection at all. Ask questions at the end if you like. Just not enough time for one talk. So, hi, I'm me. I've been doing Postgres since 97, 98. I kind of forgot exactly when I, when I got involved with Postgres. It was around the 7.1 era. Um, I've been doing Django since 2008, so not nearly as long. I've been consulting with PostgreSQL experts. We're a small company in San Francisco that does basically full-time Postgres consulting. Um, I'm the Django guy. Um, uh, my website is called thebuild.com. The slides for this are available there. And they're actually there now. I always forget to upload them. And you can follow me as XOF on Twitter. So the philosophy is, it's really actually hard to misconfigure Postgres. You kind of have to go out of your way. You can do it, believe me. If you want advice on that area, I'm happy to share it. But Almost all the performance problems you hit in Postgres are not Postgres problems, they're application level problems. And don't obsess about it, really. Tune it, go back to sleep, go work on your job, the thing that someone's actually paying you to do. And there's a lot of material here for a short talk, so there's no time to explain, just do this, okay? Ask me questions in the hall later if you, have, if you think I've blown it, which I probably will have at some point. So okay, first thing, how to install Postgres. Use packages. Um, I'm an old BSD guy, and so I like had the serious build it from source mentality, which took me years to get rid of. There's kind of no point anymore. The packaging is fine. Um, the distro packages are generally okay. The problem is they're usually back a rev or two. Um, so if you want something that's the, mo the absolute most current, 
There are alternate repos. There's yum.postgresql.org for Red Hat. Um, and there's, for Ubuntu, there's Martin Pitt's repos, which are really great. And he updates them really, really fast when a new, when a new version's pushed. So just, you know, apt-get install PostgreSQL. And it even starts it up for you. You know, by the time you're done, you can log into the darn thing. Um, Linux configuration on the operating system. Turn off the ohm killer. The ohm killer is a bug, not a feature. Apparently, according to the kernel people, the thing people do with, with, um, with Linux, the one thing they do is run open office. And the ohm killer is perfect for that situation. That's, of course, what everybody in this room is doing. And they're all running, you know, it's like, no, it's for a server, it's silly, just turn it off. Um, it's really bad with Postgres. Um, for a file system, you use either ext4 or XFS. Um, you know, ext3 is like big band file system, you know. It's like what your dad used. It's not rock and roll. Just, um, if you want the details of why, I'll go into them, but just use either ext4 or XFS. The one, the, the one to use is the one that kind of get, is the other one that happens by default. They're pretty much equal in terms of Postgres stuff. Um, there are two kernel parameters in, in Linux you have to set, schmax and schmall. You set them once and forget them. There's perfectly good documentation on the Postgres site. But when Postgres, you try and start up Postgres, it gives you this horrible error message of the sky is falling in because of schmax and schmall. That's what it's talking about. It's one setting, you're done. So you've, you've done that, and Postgres starts up. And it'll start up fine. And then you say, but it's got to be tuned. Everybody knows about tuning the system. OK, we'll tune it. Great. We're going to tune this stuff. Logging, resources, checkpoints, and the planner, and then you're done. This, this should take you like 15 minutes. Tell your boss it takes three hours, but it takes about 15 minutes. Um, and then, you know, off to Ibiza. OK, logging. Do logging first. The reason is you can get good stuff out of logging that you can use to tune the rest of it. Be generous with logging. It's, a very, it's very low impact on the system. They're fun to read. You can feed them into PG Badger or PG Fuin and get really great graphs. You can email them to people who are not technical, and it really looks like you're doing your job then. Um, it's also the best for, um, point of information for finding performance problems. So the, um, Postgres spits out these text logs. They're sometimes called the error logs, sometimes the standard error logs. These are, these are text logs it emits during normal operation to tell you what's going on. Um, you have three choices. You can dump them to syslog. If you already use a syslog for a bunch of stuff and have a nice syslog infrastructure you like, use that. You can dump in standard format to files. Um, if you're using tools that need standard format, increasingly few, they'll only take standard format. Um, there's also CSV format. That's kind of the modern hip and with it what all the cool kids are doing format. Um, the nice part about that is you can import it back into Postgres database and like run queries on it, and that's kind of really neat. So generally use CSV format to files. So what to log? Set this, you're done. This is why you want to download the slides. Um, basically, it's a fairly generous, high volume logging. The only one I'll call out in particular here is log min duration statement. That means if a statement takes more than 250 milliseconds, it'll be logged. That's kind of a good round number. If you have this giant data analysis database where everything takes 10 years to run, set it to like you know 11 years. Um, or if, if something's a supposed to be a really super fast responsive, you might set it as low as 10. You can set it to zero to log everything, which is a good idea to do if that won't make the logs unmanageably big. Otherwise, you just turn on all this stuff, and away you go. So now you're done with logging. That was fast. So resource configuration. People agonize, just agonize over Postgres's memory usage. Like, well, you know, I'll get these emails from clients saying, well, our shared buffers is set to seven gigabytes, and we want to bump it up to eight. You know, we're having this performance problem. Will that help? And the answer is, of course it won't help. You will never notice that. That's totally lost in the noise. Then I say something nicer in the email. But anyway, um, shared buffers set to 25% of, avail of, of, of um, either available or total memory. That's how accurate we're being here. It's like, yeah, whatever, set it to 25% of something. Um, up to eight gigabytes. Postgres doesn't really take advantage of shared buffers above eight gigabytes. So yes, if you have a 96 gigabyte machine, you're still setting that to just eight gigabytes. That's okay. Really, that's, that's just fine. Work BAM, um, set it to two times the total RAM size divided by the max connections. It's a nice round number. We'll talk a little bit about where you might want to change that, but that'll keep you safe. You won't get out of memory problems. Set maintenance works RAM to RAM divided by 16. So if you have 16 gigabytes, set it to one gigabyte. 
and effective cache size to RAM over two. Notice, just so everyone knows, effective cache size is a hint to the planner. It doesn't actually ever allocate that much memory. This is the reason that shared buffers going up to eight gigabytes is okay, because Postgres really leans on the file system's level cache to do most of its caching. This is only for the real super hotspot stuff. So, so if you have a 16 gigabyte machine, set it to effective cache size to eight. And max connections, no more than about 400. Lots of people crank, just crank max connections up. If you feel a need to set max connections over 400, it's probably time to look at a front end pooler. And we'll talk a little bit about front end poolers. But 400's a, you know, nice round number, whatever. So checkpointing. This is a couple of parameters that can actually make a significant difference to your performance. They're easy to set. Checkpoints are a complete flush of all the dirty buffers in memory to disk. So all that shared, memory, that shared buffers we just, once in a while Postgres decides, okay, I'm getting a little nervous. I'm gonna swap, swap all this stuff out to disk. There's nothing about this that, that um, hurts or um, improves data integrity. Data integrity is guaranteed either way, but occasionally it does this so restart time is kept under control. This is potentially a lot of I.O. This is where the I.O. really spikes on Postgres when it does this. And it does it um, in, two, in two cases. It's written a particular number of wall segments, which for the purposes of this talk means it's a certain amount of, of write activity has happened been in the database. So, for example, if it's 32 wall segments, a wall segment is 16 megabytes, that means it's written, you know, 32 times 16, about as um, of changes to the database. Or a timeout occurs. Just Heartbeat timeout. So the checkpoint um, checkpoint segments is the number of, of segments. So you multiply that by 16 megabytes in the number I just gave you, and the timeout's the timeout. The um, checkpoint completion target is multiplied by the timeout for the amount of time Postgres will try and spread the checkpoint out. So 0.9 is good because you want this to be high, so the I/O doesn't try and cram it all out to the disk really, really fast. But this is a good, you know, and wall buffer just says it's 16 megabytes. There's never any reason for be anything else. Don't worry about what it is. Um, so generally, you want to start at about 32 segments. And then you look at the logs. Do I talk about this? Maybe I do, maybe I don't. Yes. Um, and then it, because it'll write in my, if you accepted my logging configuration, of course you did, um, it'll show you every time it does a checkpoint. And if they're happening faster than that checkpoint timeout, just keep bumping up checkpoint segments until the messages, until it only happens, um, until the timeout is firing instead of the number of checkpoint segments. Once you've done that, you're done. And again, don't obsess about it. The only reason to start getting really concerned about this is if your checkpoints are swamping the I.O. subsystem and you've done all this, you need better hardware. And really, you've, you've started to hit the right limit on your hardware at that point. Because no, you know, Postgres, can, you know, if you if you have a really horrible slow disk subsystem and you're pounding the database with changes, eventually the system will run out of horsepower. So there's some settings to tune the planner. By the way, that was it for checkpoints. Now you're done. That was easy. Um, effective I/O concurrency. You set it to number of I/O channels. Basically, this means the number of read operations that can be going on simultaneously. So if you have, for example, a RAID 10 array, set it to the total number of disks in the array. Um, if you have an SSD, set it to the number of channels on the controller. It'll help a little bit, not revolutionary, but you know, why not get it right? Um, random page cost. Generally, if you're running on a RAID 10, you want to set about three. Um, if you're running on a SAN, you want to set it about two. If you're running on EBS, set it to 1.1. How many people here are currently running Postgres on top of Amazon on an EC2 instance? Okay, that's about the usual percentage, okay. If you go to the blog, I also have this whole talk about running Postgres on, on EBS. You might want to check it out. And that's it for planner settings. Cool. All right, you've now configured Postgres. That was easy. Okay, cool. So here are some easy performance boosts. We'll talk about general system stuff, stupid database tricks. That is to say, for performance improvement, don't do these. Um, some SQL pathologies a little bit about indexes, and about tuning vacuum, because no talk on Postgres is complete without talking about vacuum. So general system stuff. Uh, don't run anything besides PostgreSQL on the host. Really, you know, don't run your, J2, your, your, um, your JBoss server, or your web server, or the, the Django app server, or all these things that take time and um, attention. Move it to its own server. That by itself will get you the most, the, this is sort of like the stop smoking of health improvement. 
you know, it's like, well, first stop killing yourself, and then we'll talk about getting healthier. Um, if it's on a VM, remember <laughs> that that counts <laughs> as, you know, the fact that you are, you, you know, that it's, it's, this is like, okay, we're on a VM, so this is like smoking but having a really good air extractor and saying, you know, okay, well, well, now we're not breathing secondhand smoke. You're still sharing that box, so make sure you have enough resources within your VM. So that, that was, so don't do those. Um, first thing, sessions in the database. Just don't do that. It's, it creates a lot of traffic. It creates a lot of traffic gratuitously. It's fine during development, but in production, that will kill you. It'll generate these huge tables, and no one ever remembers to prune that table, ever. I've never gone into a site that had sessions in the database that remembered to run the Django process to prune that table. So constantly updated accumulator records. This is things like one master record in the database that has the number of sales in it that's constantly being hit every time something happens, or a click count in a user record. Don't do that. Generate those statistics on the fly when you need them, but it creates huge locking problems to have this single record that you're pounding all the time. Task queues in the database. I love Celery. I hate Celery in the database because it pulls the database, and anything that pulls the database is broken by definition. So, this is what Redis is for. This is what all these other products are for. There are hundreds of products that do this really well, not Postgres. Using the database as a file system. Um, this is like putting your image files in the database. Postgres will do it. It has this blob type, it's great, takes up to two gigabytes, but it's doing this because it likes you, not because it wants to. <laughs> you don't, um, generally, you, what you want to do is, and fortunately in the case of Django, Django's file, file field just makes this easy for you, is put the darn thing in the file system. I mean, every single operating system, modern operating system, ships with a database, a large object database that is optimized to store and retrieve this data. It's called the file system, so use it. Fortunately, Django makes that easy, so we don't see that as often as we might. Um, frequently locked singleton records. This is less common now, in my experience, than it used to be, but this will be things like um, again, these, these master accumulator records across the whole system, a system setting table that for some reason you write on every request. Basically, you've now required every single request, take a number and file up, waiting for that record to be unlocked. And then you wonder why Postgres is so slow. Um, and very long running transactions. Never, ever, ever hold a transaction open in any database that is, um, that is waiting for an asynchronous event to occur user interaction, a request to the website, something like that, get in, do your business, get out really fast. Transactions should be fa very fast. Only hold the transaction open for as long as you need to. So, um, this is the number one Django pathology. I even do this sometimes, I blush to admit. Um, which is using, if you're bulk loading a database, using insert instead of copy. PsychoPG2, which is basically the only interface library to Postgres from Python that makes any sense to use, has a really fast and efficient copy operation, use it. Doing each one by an insert is very inefficient, especially when you're loading millions of rows. You add that on top of the model creation time in Django, which is quite non-trivial, really slow compared to a bulk copy. So use, a co use copy, use that very nice little copy operation PsychoPG gives you. Um, and this is like sort of the first thing that happens to people, is you're building this transactional database, it's recording web clicks or some other kind of thing, and then you come in and say, I want to know something, like run a I want to run a big query, and the whole thing falls over. Generally, those kinds of traffic loads do not play well together on the same database. We'll talk a little bit about ways of handling this problem on Postgres, but generally, don't run these huge crunchy data analysis queries at the same time it's handling a high transaction load. Run it at night, run it on a replica of a streaming replica pair, do something like that. Get that load off, the, the, don't mix these loads on the same database. So, SQL pathologies. This is the other typical Django anti-pander is the gigantic in clause, which is typically happens because somebody will retrieve from the database a giant list of IDs and then pass it into another ORM query saying, oh, get me all of these guys, please. I have actually seen a client run themselves out of uh, disk space because of the text logs necessary to record these queries. <laughs> the individual queries were 1.2 megabytes each. 
And it looks so innocent in the Python. It's two lines, you know, bing, bing. And then you're testing it on these little toy databases and it's like eight. And then you roll it out into production and it's 500,000. And then you wonder why Postgres is so slow. It took like 15 minutes to parse the query. So don't do this. This is a join. Use a join. Yes, I know Django's join syntax is not everything it could be. Tough. Use a join. Um, there is no index in the world that optimizes these. Stan any standard index? Uh, un unanchored free text searches? Use the built-in full text search? It's really cool. People just run out, you know, they say, free text search, I must run out and buy so and get solar. And they run over to the solar shop and they're spending all their lives installing this J2E, blah, 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 blah. And, and poor Postgres is sitting there saying, but, but I do full text search, it's built in. So just use it, it's very nice. There's like Django snippets all over the place for using it from Django. Um, this is the other big pathologies, one of the other big pathologies, which is the loop, which says grab a record, process it, return it. Grab a record, process it, return it. The canonical example I like to use of this is, some, is a system that every night looped through every order, incrementing the number of days that order was, had been open. Well, first of all, arguably, you should not be keeping that information stored that way. You should have a, order, a place date on the order. However, that's one update statement. Django has an update operation in the ORM. Just use that. Don't have these loops that go like that. Very bad. Okay. So we talked about what an index wouldn't do. People really get into indexing on, in Django. They love it because you just say index equals true. And bang, there's an index where there was none before. It's great. And indexes are good, right? They're wonderful. You should have indexes on everything, right? Wrong, of course. So what is a good index? A good index has these characteristics. It has high selectivity on, performing, on, on commonly performed queries. That means it, when you do the query, it will get back relatively few rows. And you do that all the time. So if you query a million row table, you get 500 rows back. That's very good selectivity. You query a million row table, you get 500,000 rows back, that's bad selectivity. You want high selectivity. Or it's required to enforce a constraint, like a primary key, a unique foreign key, something like that. A bad index is every other index. There are no other good indexes. You, it must have both those characteristics, because if it lacks those characteristics, a sequential scan is more efficient and you don't need the index. It's either non-selective, you're getting most of the rows back. Most in Postgres ease is like between 10 and 20% is kind of where an index starts running out of power. Um, it's rarely used, which means you only get 10 or 20% back, but you run this query once a month. But every insert into that table has to maintain the index, so that's expensive. Or it's expensive to maintain, like it's a really complicated functional index or something like that that, is not, that doesn't repay its overhead. Um, it's very, very common to see tables where the indexes are larger than the actual underlying table. That's extremely common. And, and sometimes you need that, but rarely you do you, but, but that's a relatively rare situation. And just to note, if you create a multi-column index, um, only the first column can be used separately. So if you have an index on A and B, you, uh, that will accelerate queries on A, but it will not accelerate queries on B. So don't, you know, just, it's, Postgres can or and and together indexes, so if you're doing A's and B's in that case, you want to create a separate index on both. So that's cool, okay. And lastly, so don't go just randomly creating index on a hunch, that's what I do. Um, the, um, <clears throat> there are two tables you want to look at in Postgres. You just log in, yes, you, if you're running Postgres, learn how to use PSQL, it's your friend, it won't hurt you. Um, and look at two built-in tables. One's called PGStat user tables and PGStat user indexes. And look for indexes that aren't being used very often and tables that are being sequentially scanned a lot. And those are the places you need to focus your work. Okay? All right, so ongoing maintenance. Talk a little bit about monitoring, backups, disaster recovery, schema migrations, stuff, monitoring. So always monitor even if it's just disk space. At the absolute minimum, just monitor how much disk space. Because running out of disk space is really embarrassing. Um, system load is handy. I'm not a big, you know, the, the usual system load number on a database server can be really misleading because of spin locks and IO weight and stuff like that. 
Um, the number I like to um, look, um, look at more than anything, and also most, most Postgres ins installations are not super CPU intensive in terms of absolute compute time. Um, the ones I, what I like to monitor are disk space and the um, util um, SAR produces the IO utilization for the disks, the, the disks that the um, database is living on. That's probably the most interesting one because if the IO utilization hits 100% and sort of pegs there, then you know the system's gonna be going slow. Um, you know, memory's good too. Um, generally, Postgres doesn't run you out of memory, but it's good. One minute bins, yeah, thanks. Um, and there's a check Postgres tool at checkpostgres.org. For backups, there's PG Dump. It's the easiest Postgres backup tool, very low impact on the database. Um, unlike um, common conceptions, Postgres is, continues to write and operate just fine when PG Dump is running. It does not prohibit writes to the disk. It is completely consistent. It makes a copy, but gets impractical when the database gets big. So in which case you use stream your application. It's very easy to set up. Um, it maintains the exact logical copy of the database on a different host, make sure it really is a different host. Amazon has um, client affinity for VMs. So if you create two right in a row, you're probably running on the same physical piece of hardware. Um, doesn't guard against application failures, however. Um, but replication can be read on queries. If you're getting query cancellations, there are, occasionally you'll see these query cancellation messages. Set that parameter. And you can also PG dump the replica if you want, you know, if you want to distribute load. Three, stream replication is all or nothing. You can only replicate the entire database or none of it. You can't replicate just this table or just this database or anything. Um, you want to do, there are trigger-based replication tools that let you give, that give you more control. Those are not part-time jobs. They're a little more complicated setup and they can be kind of fiddly. Um, lastly, I want to mention wall archiving. This is the old way of handling this. Of, po of doing streaming replication like stuff. And the nice part about this is you can do point in time recovery with it. So when you drop the table by accident, you can replay the database to just before that horrible thing happened. It's slightly more complex to set up, but it's really worth it for security. So you can read about that stuff. And you can use it alongside streaming replication, which is that three host cluster for maximum disaster recovery and tolerance is what we usually set up. For quick diagnosis, log in, learn how to log in with PSQL. Look at, there are two tables, PG stat activity and PG locks. You can, you sort of cycle between them to find out who's looking at a lock. You go into PG stat activity, see who's waiting. Go into PG locks, seeing what lock they're waiting for and who hold, and then go, to, go up to the, who holds it and go back to PG stat activity, see what they're doing. That by itself will let you analyze about nine tenths of all lock contention. Just talk myself out of a job, oh well. Um, some, uh, a few pitfalls, which I'll go over really quickly, encoding. Um, isn't character encoding like the most nightmarish thing ever? It's like our, it's a punishment visited on us for something bad we did, um, which is, you know, provincialism, I guess. Character encoding is fixed in a database when, it, when the database is created. Once it's set, it's set forever. You will see things online that say, oh, I just go in and modify this table and now the character encoding is something else. Do not do that. They mislead you. They do not have your best interests at heart. Um, the defaults are probably not what you want. Now most packages use UTF-8, which is probably what you do want. Um, just use UTF-8 encoding and everything's fine. Sometimes C locale makes sense, but it's a fairly specialized circumstance. So who has done this? Yes, okay. Um, I've heard about that happening. So which is you, um, you make a modification to the col a column, and Postgres then says, sure, I'll be right back, and rewrites the whole column, the table with a lock held. Um, mo all modifications to a table, um, take an exclusive lock on that table while the modification is being done. If you add a column with a default table, that means adding the column is part of that operate, is um, adding that default value, so that's a whole rewrite. This can be very, very bad, especially if you're not expecting it. So create your columns is not null or as not not null, sorry, um, as nullable, then add the constraint later once the field is populated. So create as a null column, that's really fast. It takes a lock, but a f the, the rewrite takes a lock, but a faster lock, and then create a new, or you can create a new table and copy values into it. The old table can be read, but not written in that case. Idle in transaction. I am told that this is impossible to get in Django, and yet everyone sees it all the time. It's, it's a mystery, but, but there you are. 
Um, if you see this in PG stat activity, it's a session state where a transaction is open, but it's not doing anything on that transaction. Be careful about your transaction model. If you go to my blog, I have a, um, it's on GitHub. I have a decorator called XACT that's intended to relieve this problem. Um, it seems to work. Um, you should never see this state except transiently. It should just, you know, once in a while you'll see it fly by because you happen to hit it right between two statements, but it should never be there. If you do see it and it's persisted, kill them. <laughs> kill them with fire. They're very bad because they could be holding locks that are blocking other sessions. And Django applications seem very susceptible to this. Um, vacuum freeze, once in a long while, Postgres will wake up and do a vacuum freeze operation. The, the reasons are completely outside the scope of this talk, but it can be a very big surprise. Um, the way you solve this is every few months, pick a very slack period and do a vacuum freeze yourself, so Postgres doesn't have to. I, I like um, Christmas Eve, like Christmas, um, um, uh, December 24th, 5 p.m., bang, start a vacuum freeze. Um, the, for setting up and maintaining stream replication, go to repmanager.org from our gracious competitors, Second Quadrant. It's a very nice set of tools. If you're on Amazon, there's a similar kind of thing called Wall-E for doing wall-based ba archiving. It's very nice. PG Badger is the current hotness in log analyzer tools. It replaces PG Fuin. I am told that Fuin is a, um, a stoat-like animal, so th I guess we're s the, the small mucilid thing is continuing here. Um, and if you need more, more than 400 connections, use PG Bouncer. It's a pooler. If you think you need PG Pool 2, um, talk to me. <laughs> Drop me an email or something. Because it's, it's, PG Pool 2 is kind of the advanced course in pooling. PG Bouncer is really easy to set up. It's an over lunch kind of product. Um, you can go to my blog, and you can go to my company's blog for more info and questions. <laughs> Hi. Um, at what version will Postgres sort out all those tuning parameters automatically for you? Probably never. Um, auto tuning, you know, it's, um, it's uh, we do, we actually remove more tuning pr uh, parameters at this point than we add, so the trend line is correct. Um, we can probably also at some point the shared buffers thing, which is probably the biggest single nightmare, is going to go away. But mo I would say 90%, literally, of those tuning parameters, more like 95 if I'm doing my math right, are extra for experts things that really don't affect normal operations. Sir. Yeah. Um, we currently use Amazon RDS for our database. And I was mm -hmm. wondering if you could go into a little bit more detail about like if we're using Amazon how hard it would be to use Postgres and how that would compare. You know, Amazon's just virtual machines. They tart it up rather because, you know, the lipstick level is very high there. You know, Amazon doesn't call anything by its right name. It's an instance. It's an EBS volume. You know, it's like, it's a SAN. Come on, guys. But um, so it's, but it's just, they're just VMs. You know, they're just VMs running whatever OS you care to run on them. So it's really easy to run Postgres on them in that regard. You know, 30 seconds to get a new thing up and running. I like, you know, I, I, it, I, I like Amazon a fair amount um, for some things. You just have to kind of understand that they take a very, they, they do not take an individual resource very seriously. And so resources tend to come and go in an ephemeral way, unlike other providers. So, but, um, but, it, but getting Postgres running on, on, on it is like getting it running on any other machine. It's really quite straightforward. So is there any tool with Postgres to do schema migrations that are not locking? So in MySQL, there's quite a few tools, Facebook has one and others, where no. basically they well, have. Um, the, there's locking and the, the trade-off that they're, um, they're making is schema migration inherently doesn't lock. What lock, the, the, well, it takes a lock, but the lock's really super fast. What locks is rewriting the table. Because Postgres does not have dynamic table structures. It is what it, the ta um, and that's a performance, that's a significant performance improvement. So you, but using that technique of adding it as a null, as a column that's null, and then rewriting the table, in, you know, kind of in the background, you get the same effect as, as if the, it had a normal, ta as, you know, any other tool. So there is a performance hit when you're doing that rewrite, of course. But it's, but it's manageable. Given the recent history of hacks, any trivial suggestions to increase security? 
um, use Postgres the way it's designed, and it's extremely secure. Postgres, Postgres has had, uh, as far as I know, it has had um, no in the field exploits in the last decade. It has had security patches, but as far as I know, there's never been an exploit, uh, a, 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 an actual exploit in the field that's, the, Postgres is, I would say Postgres is, the, is certainly the most secure open source operating, uh, open source database, and arguably the most, the most secure um, commercial quality database period. So just use it the way it's designed, it's really very secure. I mean, there's techniques you can use which are kind of a, long, a longer discussion, but if you use the security features that are built in, you're fine. So it's, which, whether that's a hack or not is a matter of definition. So I like Postgres a lot, but we're on MySQL and there's a whole MySQL ecosystem. How do I convince my business to change over? No, um, no, no data loss bugs in the last 15 years, unlike MySQL. <laughs> you know, it's like... <laughs> There are longer answers, but that's my top level one. Yeah. Um, I've changed the encoding on template one lots of times. I'm, I'm sorry, could you repeat? I've changed the encoding on template one lots of times, mm -hmm. and you said not to do uh, that. As lo you're, you know, <laughs> I've run with scissors too, you know. Um, <laughs> you know and so, yeah, to date, I have not followed on them. Well, I was just wondering what I might because have done Because you you, what about. you are doing is you're telling Postgres, I guarantee there are no bad values in this database. I know for sure the new encoding is perfectly represented. Okay. And because, because you're breaking the seal, basically, at that point and saying, you know, and all bets are off. Okay. Um, you know, it's, um, sure, it works, but that's, you know, but you're, you're, you're in a, because you're breaking the, breaking, uh, Postgres will just assume you know what you're doing at that point. It is very rare that you, in fact, have perfect data in the database. It's really easy to get high bit data into, um, into a SQL ASCII database, and switching from, you know, it's, it's switching to SQL ASCII is always okay. You may get, you know, not get what you like, but it'll never cause the problems in the database. But switching to a more restrictive encoding, you will start getting weird problems if it runs into seven-bit characters that are not compliant with the- So um, if the, I start getting weird problems, I'll, I'll know that's probably what happened. Well, you know, it depends <laughs> on how many years, years in the future you're willing to have those weird problems happen and how much pain you're willing to pay at the time the weird problems happen. Well, I left that job. It doesn't matter anymore. <laughs> <laughs> That's between you and your employer. <laughs> um, I've seen some uh, blog posts saying you can alter tables by changing the metadata structures, like if you want to change the uh, column width. And uh, um, so, if, for example, you don't have to run an alter statement which updates every single row. Um, is that like a discouraged thing to do? Yes. <laughs> Again, you know. You can, you can do anything you want. You can go in with a hex editor and change the structure if you like. Um, I mean, I'd be a little snide, but not much. The, the um, you know, some are safe, some aren't. The problem is there's no warranty on which ones are and which ones aren't. Um, generally, alter data, you know, the Postgres now is much better about not doing rewrites when the new type is 100% compatible. But at the point that you change something to a different number of bytes in the field, you've corrupted your database. And, you know, some database corruption kills you instantly. Some, the database is wounded and staggers on for a while, and, you know, you see what, um, but, um, so the answer, the answer is if it's the same number of bytes in the record, you're probably okay. If it's a different number of bytes, you're almost certainly not okay. Thanks. Sure. All right, thank you very much, Christoph. <laughs>